Corrie Sharke is a former Bush State Department and White House Defence Advisor. She was also a senior advisor to Senator John McCain's presidential campaign in 2008. And last year, Sharke co-authored a book with now Defence Secretary James Mattis. And she has been watching this administration's Afghan policy review process very closely. Well, Corrie Sharke, welcome to the program. Thanks for being with us. It's a great pleasure. So, we finally saw the announcement of President Trump's Afghanistan policy strategy uh, this week. To what extent do you think he was dragged kicking and screaming into that announcement? I think you're exactly right. I think he was dragged kicking and screaming, both because of his own testimony, right? He campaigned against it. He clearly believed we should walk away from the Afghan war. And it took months and months of the secretaries of state, defense, the national security advisor, repeatedly engaging with him to to persuade him that what he wanted to do would actually result in the United States being less safe. What did he actually announce? Because he didn't talk specific numbers. He said victory has to be clearly defined, but then proceeded not to clearly define victory. So what if anything happened this week? I actually disagree with you. I think he did outline an outcome. What the what the purpose of this strategy is, is supporting the government of Afghanistan until its police and military can handle the threats that are emerging in that society. They've made an enormous amount of progress over the course of the last 16 years, but they have work still to do. You know, in 2001, Afghanistan was 185th on the list of UN human, on the UN Human Development Index. There are only 192 or so countries. Um, and so building the governmental capacity to govern the territory, building national security forces that could handle a really serious threat in al-Qaeda and now and the Taliban and now also ISIS. The Afghan national security forces are sustaining 31 killed in action a week. They had 10,000 deaths in combat in the course of the last year. And Afghans are still signing up for their security forces. They are fighting the fight. We are in a support role, Australia, the United States, the countries of the coalition that want Afghanistan to succeed. So what we have done is move to the background, but continue to provide the sort of professionalization and the sort of military support that they need to stay in this fight. The president also said, we're not in the business of nation building. In the past, he said, why do we keep building schools and roads for people that turn around and, and try and shoot us? Uh, is there going to be a significant shift away from the kind of soft power of, of building a, a modern, cohesive, democratic Afghanistan in favour of uh, simply a, a holding pattern to say the Taliban doesn't win at the end of this. Yes, you're right. I do think this represents a narrowing of the strategy away from more traditional counterinsurgency and n more narrowly towards, um, towards counterterrorism. So focusing more on helping Afghan national security forces fight terrorists and leaving more space for the government of Afghanistan on its own to find its path to governance. It doesn't seem to be a particularly ambitious vision for Afghanistan. Is it ultimately the only realistic path from here? Were there other options on the table being put before the president that he, he might have set aside but uh, might have been better, do you think? I certainly think there are other options. I am myself very much in favor of nation building. I actually worry a little bit about this strategy that we may be creating circumstances where the military capacity of the government will dramatically outpace its judicial, its legislative, and its other elements. And that's how we got to military coups in Latin America and um, across the last hundred years, before democracy was deeply embedded in the governments of, of our Latin American neighbors. So I do think there are other options, wider engagement with Afghan society. But, but the president did increase American forces by 40 percent and will probably be coming back to America's allies for more assistance, too. So it's not an unambitious strategy. It's more ambitious than President Obama's strategy, which was 
uh, internally contradictory in its objectives and limited in both its time and its troops to achieve them. So it was dramatically under-resourced for what it wanted to do. This strategy does look to me to be adequately resourced for what it's attempting to do. You say that the Obama strategy was dramatically under-resourced. At one point, that surge took numbers in Afghanistan up to around 100,000, uh, but with an inbuilt timetable for, for a drawdown. Do you agree with President Trump's assessment that that was a fundamental mistake, that if you, if you signal your punches, if you say what you're going to do in three or four years from now, the Taliban and others will just wait you out? I do think it's a dramatic difference from the Obama administration's approach, and it's absolutely the right one, both for giving confidence to our friends and partners and for preventing our adversaries from thinking they can wait us out. Um, I think that's what you have seen in Afghanistan since uh, President Obama started the drawdown. Which, well, since he announced the drawdown, people thought they could wait us out. And then as troops were drawing down, you did see the Taliban begin to retake territory. 10% of Afghanistan is now fully in their control. Another 20 to 30% is being contested. The Afghan National Security Forces are doing that fighting, and they're doing it extraordinarily bravely and very well, and deserve more help from us than President Obama's strategy was giving them. President Trump also talked about the need for Pakistan to step up its its work in the in the fight against terror, and also talked about the role that he'd like to see India playing in the development of Afghanistan, not nation building, but developing. Now, can you kind of unpick that for us and, and how that plays into the sort of traditional rivalry between India and Pakistan and how that's likely to be read in Islamabad? I think you're exactly right that that's the, that's the Achilles heel of this strategy and probably of any strategy for helping Afghanistan to a better, more peaceful, more stable place which is that Pakistan has been, they're a bordering country, they've been permitting cross-border operations, they have failed to crack down on the Haqqani network and on other invidious forces operating in Afghanistan. The government of Afghanistan has complained about that for years. The Indians have long been a much more supportive, cooperative force with the government of Afghanistan. It will be interesting to see whether the president praising India and encouraging a greater Indian role in Afghanistan while castigating the role Pakistan has played, whether that makes it easier or harder for Pakistan to shift its policies to do what he wants. I suspect it will infuriate the Pakistanis to see India so praised. Stabilization of Afghanistan is not the only thing we want from Pakistan. Right? Control of their nuclear weapons, prevention of war with India, prevention of them uh, proliferating their nuclear and missile technologies. And it will be much harder to achieve Pakistani cooperation on those other things if we are hitting them this hard over Afghanistan. What do you make of the internal Trump administration politics uh, that we've seen? You know, it, it's tempting to say, well, Steve Bannon left on Friday while Trump and his generals were at, uh, at Camp David coming up with what we saw announced uh, this week. Therefore, uh, Trump is now officially listening to the generals and not listening to the, uh, to the nationalists. Is that, is that a reasonable read on it? I don't think we can ascribe to Steve Bannon getting kicked overboard the fact that the president uh, adopted this policy. I think this was several months in the making where the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the National Security Advisor created a process of trying to um, uh, trying to develop a strategy. The president was clearly uncomfortable with it for months. Both You can tell both because he held off from making a decision and because he encouraged people like Eric Prince from outside the administration who had um, untraditional approaches to the problem to try and provide alternative solutions. I think the president really was thrashing around, didn't want to do this, but understood the risks associated with walking away and eventually persuaded himself, wasn't persuaded by others, that he needed to take responsibility for a better solution. Do you think the national security establishment, such as it exists, and it's obviously not of monolithic views, but do you think it's reassured by this process? <laughs> it took a long time to get here. Right. Well, to the extent that I am representative of it, I can tell you I breathed a huge sigh of relief when I heard the president's speech, because I thought there was at least a six in 10 chance 
that the president would feel boxed in by agreement in his cabinet and frustrated that just like with uh, validating the Iran agreement, that this wasn't what he came here to do and just flip the table over and walk out. So the fact that General McMaster creating a process of of consultation that vetted options that the president went outside the system and was and brought in other ideas that were then taken seriously and evaluated and that the cabinet came up with a political and an economic and a military strategy that was internally consistent I actually think is the first really good news story of national security in the Trump administration are you confident enough that that will continue when it comes to <laughs> Iran and, and North Korea, or are they all very individual battles that have I to be won? I am not confident at all that we <laughs> will see continued disciplined behavior, and I don't think there's any reason to believe that, because the problem, the, the erratic, the free radical in this equation is the president himself. Um, and to the extent he lets himself be guided by processes in his administration is, is always his choice. Um, so I'm actually pretty worried about whether the president is going to let himself be persuaded that walking away from the Iran agreement at this point would put us in a worse position because our allies aren't going to reimpose sanctions even if we do. And therefore, we will be isolated. Iran won't be isolated. But the president's thrashing about on that one. And I think his general management style is to create competing centers of power, none of which fully get his support so that he can reward or penalize them um, at will to keep all boats rocking. I think that's the management style he prefers. And he's the only one of them who got elected. He can run the, the executive branch any way he likes. Indeed he can. Gauri Sharkey, many thanks indeed for your time. It was a pleasure.